two, one, and we are live. Okay. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants from various parts of the world. I am Dr. Kavita Pandey, heading the Department of Five Years Integrated Course in Bioanalytical Sciences at Guru Nanak Khalsa College, Mumbai. On behalf of all the organizers, Guru Nanak Khalsa College, the Swedish and South Asian Network of Research for Fermented Foods, Lund University, Sweden, and Anand Agricultural University, Anand, Gujarat, I welcome each one of you for this virtual conference on the role of fermented food in the pandemic era. Let me just give you a glimpse of Guru Nanak Khalsa College. The college was established in the year 1937, and I'm proud to share that we have successfully delivered 83 academic have done our part contributing the society by developing leaders, entrepreneurs, sportspersons, scientists, and many more. We work on the motto of a sense to wisdom is service to humanity. We are accredited by NAC with a grade A and CTPA score of 3.54. We have been awarded with several accolades, including the College with Potential of Excellence by UGC, the Star College Status by DBT, we are recipient of the fifth grant by DST, we are zero recognized, and we hold one of a kind facility at Khalsa, which is called as the National Facility for Biopharmaceuticals. Research is an integral part of teaching and learning processes in Khalsa. The dedicated wing of research of Khalsa College is called the Guru Nanak Institute for Research and Development. And I'm happy to share that we offer several interdisciplinary industry-oriented courses, including bioanalytical sciences, bioinformatics, nutraceuticals, and many more. Moving on. Well, the first wealth that we have is our health. And I think COVID-19 has made everyone accept this mantra. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. It is something that everyone is looking forward to. And each one is conscious about one's immunity. Immunity has a lot to do with what we eat. Nearly every culture has a version of fermented foods. We talk about yogurt, kefir, miso, fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, pickles, kimchi, and many more. Fermented foods contain natural probiotics, or, you know, they take your health to the next level. There are several arguments, like they enhance the stability, they enhance the nutritional content, they are good for better digestibility and for enhanced palatability. And for many such reasons, there is a growing interest to explore the community of this fermenting microbe and their properties to the energetics of processes and to the product quality. Coming to the idea of the conference, here we are aiming to create a platform to create awareness and bring forth and foster the potentials of fermented foods as functional medicines, especially in the prevention of COVID-19 infections like situations. We also aim for a brainstorming session to discuss the facts about the role of fermented foods in fighting such pandemic errors. So with that small introduction, I think I will request Dr. Hardy, who is the secretary of SATNET, to give an introduction about the organization, our collaborator. Before moving to that, I would like to quickly introduce my uh, colleague, Dr. Hardy. He's working as the assistant professor in the Department of Dairy Microbiology, SNC College of Dairy Science, Arnold. He pursued his PhD as well as doctoral research from NDRI, that is Karnal. And recently, he completed his postdoctoral study at the University of Queensland School of Agriculture and Food Sciences. He has over 55 research pub publications and three edited books to his credit. He's an editorial board of various journals. To name a few is he's also the executive editor of International Journal of Fermented Foods. He has handled several externally funded projects sponsored by DST, DBT, ICAR, SPI, or OPI. And is, he's a recipient of several 
prestigious awards. To name two of them, it's the Early Career Research Award by DST, the Best Teacher Award by ICAR at Arnand Agricultural University. With this short introduction, I would now request Dr. Hati to take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, now I have shared my first uh, slide, means title slide. It is visible to all of you. Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, first, I, I, I am very much uh, uh, thankful to Dr. Kabita. She has taken a lot of interest to organize this conference, and uh, she is uh, is being associated with us. Uh, I think last four five years, and she introduced me well. So I will give a overview of our network. Uh, the network is being created by two uh, very popular, uh, popular or expertise persons. Uh, you know, Dr. Babu Nair, sir. So he is the uh, chairman of this network, and Prajapati sir, Dr. Jb Prajapati sir, uh, he is the coordinator of the Sasnet Fermented Foods. And these two persons has taken a lot of pain to create this platform, which we are, are just following their path and maintain their status. So I, I will just uh, give the overview how the network is working uh, since uh, 2001 when they have just uh, started it. Uh, so first, uh, from the network, we give thanks to the Swedish Agency for Research and Cooperations, Lund University, Sweden, Anand Agriculture University, Irma, uh, Anand, Siva Food, Sweden, and Navard India, because they are the helping hand for us, and they are always helping for or smoothly organizing all all the seminar conferences uh, with the network. So the seeds were sown in the year of 2001 on 20th September when J. B. Prajapati sir delivered a lecture on probiotics, uh, fermented foods, and their beneficial role for Sasnet at Lund University. Uh, on that time, they started. They th they thought that they should start this network, and and they they really did this wonderful job. And now we are enjoying this platform. The first international conference was uh, organized at IRMA on uh, November 13 to 14 in 2003. And, and on that conference, uh, they <coughs> did a, uh, uh, you know, that they, they, they thought that we should take the uh, participants view that we are going to start a network. So should we are in the right, right path or not? And they, they got the hi highest, uh, you know, the vote or or you can say all are, all are uh, likely minded people and they said yes we should uh, create this kind of network and and we'll, we we should help the societies for creating health status and social well being and then then the sasnet fermented foods network uh, as a society they registered at tivandrum in 2008 and this is the network this network is an association of researchers professionals academicians food industry personnel and all those who are interested in research, development, and promotion of the uh, fermented foods, especially for public health and social well-being. This is the uh, main target of this uh, network for all of us who are really interested in the fermented foods. What are the objectives? Why it is being created? So first, it, it was created to develop a forum for the scientists of the South Asian countries, Sweden, and other countries for exchanging the information in the field of food fermentation and its practical applications and the second objective was to promote the collaborative research programs among the scientists of the sweden and south asian countries in the development of fermented foods as well as fosters and maintain the research links with the scientists of similar interest all over the world and and the third is very important that to collect and disseminate the knowledge on fermentation of foods from the south asian countries and to collaborate with food industries in product development as, as well as the marketing of those products and, and, and another part which you can say it's, a, it's an extension work that we are organizing different kind of scientific conferences, works of seminars, symposia throughout the year. And, and what was the mission of this network? The mission was to bring, the, bring together farmers, scientists, governmental, governmental agencies, non-governmental organizations, industry personnels, producers, consumers, and anybody else who may be interested in playing a role in promoting the research and development of the fermented foods for the better public health and social well-being of the population in general and of particular. And also to, uh, to put spotlight on the importance of the developing finished products of added uh, value-added products for the globalized market and preferably the noble fermented functional foods. Uh, this, uh, when they have uh, uh, constructed this network, 
uh, from the beginning they have also created an advisory committee and and i i think that the persons who are really uh, popular famous or you can say they are the well known recognized persons in in our field uh, dr ms swaminathan dr uh, basne uh, dr ikad aste from sweden dr ek srivastava dr nagendra sa uh, all the uh, people who are really con till date they are contributing to the network and and, and we, we are always contact with them for any kind of uh, advisory uh, uh, needed for the society and we have also uh, means the network have also created a governing council or you can say the coordinating committee where mostly uh, dr babu nayar sir as a chairman and dr jb prajapati sir as a coordinator uh, they they are the uh, main uh, main persons to first uh, to uh, lead the society or to lead the network uh, to a particular uh, place so that the, everybody can uh, join together and share our views and i am working as the secretary of this network and this uh, network has already uh, organized nine international conferences six regional conferences and one conference was organized in egypt and and several guest lectures are also being organized to to workshops to workshops on problem based learning by dr babu nayar nine ninth international conference was organized uh, uh, on uh, december 2009 at uh, au anan and and this society has also taken different kinds of projects uh, in different years uh, under the, the different uh, funding agency and also the society or the network is uh, helping the other network uh, just like a sustainable uh, network of kerala so this this society or our network is also helping the uh, other uh, uh, persons to grow or other networks to grow and we are in the helping hand to others also and this network also have a strategic plan that we have a good number of members we have a well structured uh, website we publish the newsletters and we have a international journal of fermented foods we organize the regional seminars and we also publish the handbook of fermented foods and our our also aim to develop a center of excellence on fermented foods and a, a model production unit and uh, uh, this network also promote the different companies who are interested in fermented foods uh, this uh, the fastnet uh, promoted the indocore hildur functional foods dr babu's company giro eco dairy company so this uh, network also helping the uh, companies to promote the functional fermented foods uh, so at the end of the session uh, uh, i always uh, uh, request to all the participants who are attending this uh, webinar today they must join with our network our network have more than 350 members and and membership fee is very nominal for the annual and student and life member for 5000 5, rupees so uh, uh, at the end i will thank to all the participants and and especially dr kavita for organizing this webinar thank you all thank you dr hati well it's time to kick start the conference and the first speaker that we have in line is dr babu nayar a person whom i know i have had the opportunity to interact with and it's my privilege to introduce him today to the audience after his bachelor's degree in agriculture sir served as the technical officer at amul dairy he worked as the project executive with nddb anand he then pursued his doctoral research from sweden obtained his post doctorate from kyoto japan he served as the visiting professor on invitation to the kuwait university school of medicine He is a gold medalist for meritorious service from Lund University in 1999, and has several publications of national and international repute to his credit. He is a member of several committees. To name a few, is chairman. He is the chairman of the South Asian Network for Research on Fermented Foods. He is the advisor to the International Foundation of Science in Stockholm, Sweden. he is the chairman of sustainable kerala.net a society for sustainable development of kerala he is the chief editor of the international journal of fermented foods he is a scientist with entrepreneur uh, approach since 2010 he has been starting companies for commercialization of the intellectual property of his own research as well as acquired from the external sources to name a few of his startups Uh, Dr. Babu's Food Science and Biotechnology Private Limited. You heard the terms during Dr. Hathi's talk as well. Hildur Functional Foods Private Limited, Giro Eco Dairy, 
There's Gujarat Probiotics and Prebiotics, Asmian Nutrition and Nutraceuticals Products Private Limited, Indocore Flavors and Fragrance, and Indocore Ethnic Products, which are registered in Sweden. And they're being carried out and are at different stages of development. This is just a sneak peek view of Dr. Babu Sir's profile. Without further ado, I think uh, I will hand over the stage to you. Over to you, sir. Sir, unmute yourself. So, I'm in now. Yes, sir. We can hear. Yes, sir. So. So, um, hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. J.B. Prajapati, Dr. Subrata Hatti, and uh, Kavita Pandey. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. As the chairman of the Swedish South Asian Network for Fermented Foods, I like to mention that uh, it is very nice of you to initiate the organization of this meeting and Dr. Subrata Hatti to have made a good presentation of our network. I do hope that you will continue to organize seminars of this kind, bringing well-known scientists of the world closer to our members. Slide two, please. I have my academic base at the Department of Food Technology, Food Engineering and Nutrition of Lund University, Sweden. We educate food engineers at graduate level, master's level, and also doctorate level. We also have a program called International Master's Degree Program in Food Technology and Nutrition. This program is aimed at students from all over the world who want to work with innovative future food products. For instance, design and development of foods with proven health benefits. Slide three, please. What I'm going to present here is a summary of my lecture on defense mechanisms of the human body for the students of the International Master's Degree Program in Food Technology and Nutrition. Life as we understand today is a functional activity peculiar to organized matter, whether it is an animal, plant or very simple microorganisms. This activity requires constant interaction with the environment. Positive stimuli is life promoting, negative stimuli is harmful to life. What is interesting for us to look at is how human beings deal with harmful stimuli, stimuli of various types. This include all that is included in the list on this slide. Some defense mechanisms are physiological like fear, adapted or learned behavior and number of reflex connected to our senses and nervous system. Since quite early in our civilization, it was known that some individuals who were exposed to a disease became resistant to that particular disease rest of their life. However, it is only in 1796, through the investigations of English physician Edward Jenner, we learned to create resistance to a disease in an individual by creating immunity by artificial means. Thus, vaccination became a clinical technique in preventive medicine and immunology became a subject of antigen antibody reactions. Next slide, please. The first set of barriers against organisms of or materials far into the body is of course the skin, which is present all over the outer surface of the body. The inner surfaces are lined with epithelium. Under normal circumstances, microorganisms are not able to penetrate the intact skin and only very few of them can survive on the skin. Most of them are prevented by low pH of the skin, which produces lactic acid, fatty acids, and large amounts of sweat. In the respiratory tract, the cilia bring the foreign bodies to the pharynx and they are swallowed. Various secretions found on the linings of the nasal cavity, oral cavity, 
surface surfaces of the eyes and genitalia like mucus tears and saliva contain lysozyme next slide please the second line of defense the mechanism of inflammation and phagocytosis which is also called non specific or general immunity if and when microorganisms enter the body due to injury or infection then they are taken care of by specialized cells of the body inflammation is a typical reaction of the body to the entry of microorganisms blood vessels of the region are dilated to facilitate increased blood supply the permeability of the blood vessels are increased for proteins and white blood cells to initiate the process of phagocytosis by small white blood cells called macrophages macrophages are attracted to the place of injury by chemicals produced either by the injured tissue or by the microorganisms after some time macrophages get assistance from monocytes which are also white blood cells and histiocytes which are present all over the connective tissue and these are called macrophages slide 6 please in the microorganisms and if the microorganisms organisms enter deeper than macrophage macrophages located in the lymph nodules spleen liver and bone marrow come to do their part in phagocytosis main phenomenon of phagocytosis is intracellular digestion of the microbes using lysosomal enzymes in addition nitric acid and hydrogen peroxide are also produced which are extremely destructive to microbial cells the end products are either excreted or used in the metabolism of the cell itself most of the microbial invasion can be neutralized by this mechanism and that is why it is called general innate or non specific immunity next slide please the third line of defense is antigen specific immunity which is also called acquired immunity there are microorganisms and virus which cannot be defended by phagocytosis alone against such microbes the body has two types of specific immune reactions one is called humoral immunity as the antibodies which are which can bind to antigens are present in the body fluids and the other is called cell mediated immunity as it involves some specialized cells which act directly on the antigens the antibodies required for humoral immunity is produced by b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes are responsible for the cell mediated immunity humoral immunity is mediated through a reaction between specific antibodies secreted into the blood which are specific to antigen antigens are normally proteins polysaccharides toxins cell wall components or even dead cells antibodies are pro antibodies are proteins which fall under the group immunoglobulins they are five in number igg igm ige iga and igd of course most of these most abundant are igg and igm antibodies can neutralize antigens just by binding to them directly and inactivate them they can also facilitate the process of phagocytosis by binding to soluble antigens making them insoluble Anti antibody antigen complexes are often precipitated and as consequence phagocytosis is made easy antibodies can also agglutinate cells and immobilize them to facilitate phagocytosis some igg molecules bind to antigen to form opsonins which can then be bound to phagocytosis uh, in addition to this we have uh, 
have this complement activation is an another uh, process of importance. C proteins are present in the blood and they are activated by IgG and IgM to mediate extracellular killing by the killer cells. Uh, interferons, maybe I should mention that too, are cytokine proteins which stimulate production of proteins in the cells with non-specific inhibit inhibition of virus replication. Next slide, please. Cell-mediated immunity. Most of the cell-mediated immunity, uh, immunity is caused by antibodies produced by plasma cells derived from B lymphocytes. Stem cells, which are present in the lymphoid tissue, like bone marrow, thymus, bone marrow and thymus migrate to secondary lymphatic organs like spleen, lymph nodules, tonsils, and Peyer's plaques in the intestine. B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes are very similar, but quite different in function. Most of the lymphocytes remain in the lymphoid organs, but a small number circulate between various tissues and blood through lymphatic system. Main characteristic of the T lymphocytes is their ability to react with foreign cells and kill them by direct contact. T lymphocytes also attack other cells which carry antigens, virus or cells foreign to the body. For example, malignant cells or cells foreign to the body uh, which enter through transplantation. T lymphocytes mature in the thymus. When they come into contact with antigen, they produce many lymphoblasts, which are small cells specific to antigen. These cells have long life and can react quickly and strongly next time they are exposed to the antigen. Moreover, the lymphocytes produce the effector cells which on their own can produce substances which are called lymphokines with ability to attract lymphocytes, microphages and macrophages to the site of injury for facilitating phagocytosis. Slide, next slide, please. Lack of acquired immunity can cause excessive inflammatory reaction to microbial infection resulting in a situation called septic shock. Characterized by very high fever, extreme degree of vasodilatation all over the body and lowered blood pressure. This is due to the large amounts of non-specific chemical mediators, cytokines, which are secreted in the blood by macrophages following the infection. This can cause lethal systemic response. This is almost what happens to COVID-19 patients. Next one. Next slide, please. Yeah. Nutrition is a critical determinant of immune response. Protein energy malnutrition is associated with significant impairment of cell-mediated immunity. Even mild deficiency of single nutrients result in altered immune response. So, next slide, please. Immunity can be enhanced. Most of the micronutrients, uh, I mean, modest amounts of micronutrients, zinc, selenium, iron and copper, and vitamins like vitamin A, So, that's what I have uh, for you today. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Hello, That Ashish. was a wonderful insight. Yes, sir. 
we can hear you sir thank you. thank you that yes sir yeah that's that uh, i hope i hope you heard me all the way all of it yes sir we did yes sir we did and it okay. was a deep uh, yeah. dive into the mechanisms uh, that lie within our body uh, to protect us uh, okay yeah. so it moving on that, to the next talk uh, we have dr nirja hajela uh, as our next speaker i'll quickly introduce her to the audience after graduating in microbiology from ahmednagar pune she served as the research scientist in the diagnostics division immunology department of ranbaxy for about 3 years she worked as a faculty at the amiti institute of biotechnology post which she pursued her doctoral research from jamia millia islamia in 2002 later she was associated with the biotech consortium india private limited for a year before taking up the current role Presently, she is serving as the head of the science and regulatory affairs at Yakult Danan wow. India Private Limited. She holds more than 15 years of experience in developing, planning, and implementing scientific programs and appraising scientific information. And she has adapted written and oral communication to a range of audience, including the health professionals, media, and consumers. She has led and facilitated. and organized you know multidisciplinary teams for wider outreach of scientific knowledge she has organized international and national symposia for scientific deliberation on the regulatory compliances including government approval processes ensuring compliances with industry regulation necessitating necessitating the scientific data for approvals and validating the information on packaging and labels adept at fostering and maintaining strong links with key opinion leaders both at the national and global level with that a brief introduction i welcome you ma'am and i request you to take over the presentation thank you mute 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 the microphone please nirjas Nirja ma'am we cannot hear you cannot hear Has she started Please unmute yourself Can you hear me now Yes yes ma'am Can you see my presentation as well hello yes ma'am we can see yes ma'am thank you dr kavita for that lovely introduction and before i begin i must congratulate uh, professor jb prajapati professor babu nair dr kavita sasnet khalsa college for organizing this very meaningful webinar so we all know we are uh, in unprecedented times uh, this is a time we could never have imagined 8 months back i mean and but as we navigate through these very troubled times the good news is that this dreaded disease of covid-19 does not affect everyone in the same manner in fact many are asymptomatic and re recover rather quickly so uh, according to a very interesting research which was published in the nature medicine by researchers of the peter doherty university uh, of infection and immunity in australia they found that uh, a lot of people actually recovered from covid-19 like they would from flu so professor katherine who's the co-author of this publication she said that much of this had to do with the immune system and the strength of immune system in fighting infection so today we are talking a lot about immunity about nutritional interventions for building immunity for lifestyle measures to improve our immune system in this dreaded time of covid-19 so in that context i'll be talking about the science behind the use of probiotic foods in immunity building so a quick look at the definitions probiotics are live microorganisms when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host prebiotics on the other hand is a substrate which selectively utilized by the host microorganism to confer a health benefit and a combination of probiotics and prebiotics is what is symbiotics so the concept of probiotics or beneficial bacteria goes back to 7000 bc 
with introduction of fermented foods like kefir, cumis, beer, wine. In 1857, Louis Pasteur discovered lactic acid bacteria. After that, there were more beneficial microbes that were isolated. In 1908, Dr. Eli Mechnikov, he proposed the consumption of lactic acid bacteria for prolongation of life. In 1930, Dr. Minoru Shirota isolated Lactobacillus casei Shirota, and he used this to make Yakult a probiotic fermented milk drink. In 2001, we had the official definition of probiotics, and in 2020, we have more than 1,500 publications and many different probiotic foods. Now, the interest in probiotics is rekindled because of the fact that we are more microorganisms than human cells. We are harbor a hundred trillion microbes in almost every part of the human body, but the largest number of these microbes are found in the gut, known as the intestinal microbiota. Now, what are these microbes doing there? Most importantly, they are responsible for digestion of food to compounds that can be taken up by the human body. They help in absorption of nutrients like calcium, magnesium, and iron. They also help in fermentation of non-digestible dietary fiber to make short-chain fatty acids, which is a major source of energy in the large intestine. But the gut is a large surface. If you were to extend it, it is as large as a tennis court. So this requires protection, and these microbes play a very, very important role in protecting against pathogens, toxins, and allergens. And also, the gut requires an intact barrier, molecular defense systems, and a functional immune system. So it's not surprising that about 70% of the body's immunity is found in the gut. It is also the largest immune organ of the human body, and this immune system is known as the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So there's permanent communication between the microbiota and the gut-associated lymphoid tissues. The GALT has pattern recognition receptors or toll-like receptors, which recognize what is pathogenic or toxic on one hand or beneficial on the other, and the body can then react appropriately to eliminate the pathogens and toxins. And probiotics use some of these mechanisms to actually interact with the immune system and augment both the innate as well as acquired immune responses. So most importantly, they are involved in bioconversion. They convert convert the food that we eat into short chain fatty acids, and these short chain fatty acids reduce the pH of the intestinal lumen and inhibit the growth of pathogens. Now these probiotics also compete for nutrients. They compete for receptor spaces on the intestinal epithelium, and they competitively exclude pathogens. There are some probiotic strains which produce bacteriocins, which directly antagonize pathogens. These are also responsible for vitamins, production of growth factors. Many of these probiotic strains actually augment the uh, immune responses. They they also help to maintain an intact barrier function because they upregulate the production of tight junction proteins. They increase the production of mucins and prevent the translocation of bacteria and their toxins into the blood. Many of them are anti-inflammatory in nature. They produce anti-inflammatory cytokines and prevent inflammation. And now we know about the gut-brain axis, and probiotics can actually help in neurological disorders by interacting with the brain through the vagus nerve. Now, what are probiotics? As the definition, which is given by FAO and WHO, they are live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate numbers, give you a scientifically proven health benefit. So there has been a lot of confusion about traditional fermented foods being probiotic, and while probiotic strains could be lactic acid bacteria, it is very very important to remember that probiotic benefits are strain specific. Therefore, it is important that each probiotic is identified to the strain level through phenotypic and genotypic methods. These organisms must be resistant to gastric acid, bile, pancreatic juices, and reach the target site live to give you a scientifically proven health. Benefit. Then they are tested for their safety in animal models, efficacy in animal models, followed by safety and efficacy studies in humans, and then the effective dose of the probiotic strain is evaluated, identified, and this is used for formulation of a probiotic product, which is finally labeled. So what we have. With us, when it comes to probiotics, are probiotic drugs. We have probiotic medical foods. We have probiotic foods. We have probiotic infant formula. But what is not a probiotic are fermented foods with undefined microbial content or fecal microbiota transplants. 
So once you have a probiotic strain, it is also very important to determine the carrier matrix. And dairy by far is one of the most preferred medium, simply because it delivers nutrition and optimal expression of the probiotic functionality. The low pH of a dairy product helps to buffer stomach acidity and ensures viability of the probiotic bacteria. And the short shelf life for refrigeration encourages survival of the probiotic in the product and the whole compliance of food versus pill. So dairy-based probiotic foods, they actually represent the largest segment accounting for 65% of the total probiotic food market. Now, while we are talking about immunity, there's a lot of scientific data which has shown that the benefit of probiotics in different areas of health. But when there are a lot of studies which show that probiotic strains can actually augment the innate and acquired immune response and reduce the risk of infections. So this is a Cochrane review which was published way back in 20. 2015 by How et al. And this included 12 randomized control trials, 3,720 participants, which included children, adults, as well as the elderly. And what this review concluded was that probiotics were better than placebo in reducing the number of participants experiencing episodes of acute upper respiratory tract infections, their mean duration of an episode of acute respiratory tract infection, antibiotic use, and cold-related school absence. Again, because probiotics are known to improve the balance of the immune system by regulating the Th1, Th2 response, many of the strains produce anti-inflammatory cytokines. Probiotics have found benefit in allergy prevention. However, like I said, probiotic benefits are strain-specific. Therefore, every probiotic must be validated by its own dosier of scientific data for the health benefit. So just by way of example, I will take you through this strain for bacteria, which was isolated in 1930, Lactobacillus casei strain Shirota, the strain of bacteria which is found in Yakult, and, let, uh, and take you through how it builds our immune responses. So Lactobacillus casei strain Shirota, for instance, this is a probiotic bacteria. This is a gram-positive homofermentative organism which produces lactic acid as an end product of fermentation. And it has a polysaccharide peptidoglycan cell wall. So the immune modulatory property of this particular bacteria lies in the PSPG or the pep uh, polysaccharide peptidoglycan complex. And several studies have shown that regular ingestion of the strain of bacteria can increase natural killer cell activity, increase your secretory IgA levels, and phagocytic activity of white blood cells. Now, natural killer cells, as we all know, are our first line of defense against viral infections as well as cancer cells. And secretory IgA is also an important antibody which is found in the mucosal surfaces and protects us from viruses and other infections. So this is a study which was done at the Loboro University in Tokyo. This was done on athletes. Now athletes, because of prolonged exercise, have a very weak immune system, and therefore they have an increased susceptibility to respiratory tract infections. So this was done on 84 subjects. Uh, 58 completed the study. It was a 16-week study where the probiotic group was given two bottles of LCS fermented milk drink for a period of 16 weeks, and the other group got the placebo. So at the end of 16 weeks, the results of the study showed that 27% less subjects consuming the probiotic experienced URTI symptoms as compared to the placebo. Moreover, the number of episodes of URTI were also lower in the probiotic group. So if you look at what happened was that the salivary IgA concentration, salivary IgA is important in protection against viral infections. The salivary IgA levels were significantly higher in the probiotic group as compared to the placebo group. Now another, so this, uh, uh, this property of the strain of bacteria to increase salivary IgA has been studied also in the elderly and evaluated for its benefit in reducing upper respiratory tract infections in this group. So these are independent studies which were done on Belgian uh, elderly in Japanese population in age groups of more than 65 years. And these studies have also shown that consumption of LCS for a period of more than six months actually reduces the risk of respiratory tract infections, the duration of upper respiratory tract infection, and the duration with fever. 
Now, another benefit that has been observed with this particular strain of bacteria is that it has the ability to interact with monocytes and increase the activity of natural killer cells. Now, NK cells are again important uh, immune cells which protect us from viral infections and cancer. So these are studies which are done in different countries across the world, but they have shown that consumption of LCS for a period of three weeks at least has increased the NK cell activity in those healthy individuals whose NK cell activity was low. Now, NK cell activity decreases or declines because of lifestyle factors, nutrition, stress, pollution, and people with low NK cell activity are at a greater risk of viral infections and cancers. So this benefit of the strain to increase NK cell activity has been evaluated in its ability to reduce the risk of cancers. Again, these are three independent studies. The first study was done on 138 patients who had superficial bladder cancer, and they found that uh, these patients had undergone transurethral resection and were free of bladder cancer, but they found that after ingestion of this probiotic strain, the recurrence free rate was prolonged at the end of one year. The second study was on 398 subjects who had at least two, col two colorectal tumors, but they were removed. They were again free of colorectal tumors, but again, ingestion of this probiotic strain reduced the recur recurrence of tumor at the end of four years. And the third study, which is a population-based study, was done on 968 women in the age group of 40 to 55 years. And this study also showed that consuming the fermented milk drink, the probiotic fermented milk drink, at least four times in a week reduce the risk of breast cancer. So this is the kind of scientific data that is required for probiotic strains. And this particular strain, it is present in Yakult. Now, Yakult is not a medicine. It's a functional food which improves gut health and builds your immunity to reduce the risk of infections. So thus, translating the science to practice because of the emerging health benefits of probiotics, the global market for probiotic is pegged at 63 billion US dollars by the end of 2022. Of course, Asia Pacific is one of the fastest growing market and Japan, Europe and the US represents major markets worldwide. Now, India today is a hub of probiotic foods. All these products are available mostly in the form of a dairy uh, in, in a dairy form, and they all contain strains of bacteria which are scientifically tested and validated for their health benefit. However, to ensure level playing for all probiotic products, the Indian Council of Medical Research and Department of Biotechnology, they brought out guidelines for evaluation of probiotics in food in 2011. And these guidelines clearly state what it takes for an organism and a product to be called as a probiotic. In fact, the guidelines have also been published in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. And in 2016, the Food Safety Standards Authority of India brought out regulations for nutraceuticals and functional foods in which probiotics was an important category. So here they have clearly defined what it it takes for a, for a product to classify as a probiotic. The viable count of bacteria in a particular product must be 10 to the power 8 CFU per serving per day. The, these are the 28 different probiotic, these are different lactic acid bacteria species which can be added as probiotic foods. But most importantly, when it comes to a, from a, uh, to a consumer, the label is very, very important. So any probiotic food which has a probiotic bacteria must have the word probiotic food. It must contain the name or it must indicate the name of the bacteria, meaning the genus, the species and the strain. The viable number at the end of the shelf life of probiotic consumption, the recommended serving size. And because they are not medicines, they cannot be used for treatment of disease or prevention of a disease. It's very important to mention not for medicinal use or any other precaution that may be indicated. So given this time of COVID-19, where we are looking at nutritional interventions, we are looking at different ways of building our immune system and stay protected. I think probiotic strains, which are scientifically validated for the health benefit of building immunity, could be a welcome addition in the fight against COVID-19. So with that, I end my presentation by this quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, that what lies behind us and what lies before us are very tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And I'm talking about the 100 trillion microbes that outnumber the human cells by a factor of 10.
So thank you very much. I'll be very happy to take any questions on this presentation. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was uh, indeed a very comprehensive and uh, a very um, wonderful presentation covering the clinical uh, uh, data as well. Thank you very much, ma'am. We will be taking all the questions at the end of the session. So, yeah. So moving on to the next uh, speaker, we have amongst us uh, Dr. Shahid Umar. He pursued his PhD, uh, sorry, he pursued his PG from the Muslim Aligarh University in the year 1986. He served the Oklahoma University as an associate professor for a little over three years before he moved to his current position. Presently, he is the professor of surgery and the vice chair of research for the Department of Surgery at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He is an experienced professor with a documented and demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry. Also, his main area is on investigating the role of enteric pathogens in the cell proliferation, cellular transformation, and neoplasia. One of the aspects his lab is also exploring is investigating the role of gut microbiome in colon cancer and if changes in the gut bacteria can lead to drug resistance. One of the additions that they're doing is they're developing some of the prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotic formulation, which are aiming at boosting the immune system by promoting good bacteria in the gut. And that is exactly what we need in this uh, hour. And therefore, I would request Shahid, sir, to present his slide. Shahid, sir, kindly unmute yourself. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, so, do I have the presentation uh, for me? Yes, sir. Wait. Can you see the slides? So far, no, sir. Uh, okay. I you will have to give me uh, uh, permission to share the slides, I guess. One moment, sir. Dr. Nirja, please. Mm. Uh, please continue, Karo Mine is discontinued. Yes, okay. Sir, you should be able to present now, sir. Okay, let me try again. Yes, sir. Can you see it? We cannot see you. No, oh, uh, no, sir. Oh, can you see my slides? No. Huh. No, sir. So I don't Ashley, have. Can you guide? Um, uh, I, I could see you a few minutes ago, but not now. Ashish ah. or Aldrin, please guide. I was able to share yesterday, uh, so I'm I'm not sure what happened. Oh, can you see my slides? Hello, sir. No. Oh, okay. Sir, just yes, click Ashish. on that uh, bottom bar. Present now. Present. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Then entire screen. Okay. Again, the small window will appear with a desktop. Click on that and share now. Okay. Yes, yes sir, sir. We can see your slides now. Okay, great. Just give me a second. Sure, sir. Uh -oh. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. So good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to present to this extraordinary forum. Um, my name is Shahid Umar. And uh, as Dr. Pandey uh, very nicely said, uh, I'm a professor here at the uh, University of Kansas. So I'm going to talk about a uh, little bit about uh, microbiome and gut health. 
and uh, 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 throw some data of my own, uh, which is a, a part of a, a larger paper that we are working on, uh, and then discuss uh, some, uh, you know, uh, efforts to really support immunity, which is what is needed in this era of COVID-19. Uh, so I'm going to just read from one of my slides. It's called the very quest of human being is not targeted to economic progress, nor it is to achieve DFOM glory, but to reflect upon a simple question. Who are we? And uh, we are, I can tell you that we are more bacteria than human. And when it comes to bacteria, you know, they cause infection, which is well known, well accepted, and there are known treatments. However, has this mindset possibly blinded the medical community to the richness relevance of our microbial ecosystem uh, to health and disease? And that's exactly what it is. Microbiome, human microbiome is not just limited to bacteria. Uh, in, in, uh, on, uh, in contrast, uh, it's actually comprised of bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And so there are distinct uh, microbiomes uh, at each uh, body side. You have gut, lung, skin, and mucosa. And then there are other organs such as liver or pancreas that do not have a microbiome of their own, uh, but they are probably helped uh, through the uh, systemic uh, presence of um, uh, microbial metabolites, which are uh, basically released from the gut when we eat various uh, food. Uh, so human gut is home to 100 trillion bacteria, as Dr. Anuja uh, was just referring to very, uh, you know, a, a few minutes ago. Uh, and so this density of about 10 to power 11 to 12 in the colon, uh, almost a trillion in the, in the colon, that's what I call wealth management in the gut. Um, and in fact, when the field was initially uh, taking off, there was a consensus that uh, these bacteria outnumber us by a factor of uh, uh, 10 to 1. So in reality, that would have uh, suggested that, uh, uh, you know, we are only 10% uh, in hu uh, human, actually, I mean, uh, which is a very scary thought. But anyway, moving on. So there are indi uh, individuals um, in general have about, you know, greater than 160 species. About out of those, 124 have been studied. Uh, most of them belong to the two major phyla, uh, almost 90%, uh, Firmicutes as well as Bacteroidetes. Uh, and then they are some core microbiome, uh, which are most, more, more or less shared by all human beings. Uh, so if you look at the structure of the human intestinal microbiota, uh, this, this composition changes throughout the course of life. The infant microbiome shows great inter-individual variability and relatively low diversity, but becomes more diverse and converges uh, into an adult-like structure by about three years of uh, birth. Uh, pregnancy uh, is associated with an increase in actinobacteria and proteobacteria and increased diversity, but the gut microbiota returns to its original structure sometimes uh, after delivery. Uh, old age, uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, people who are uh, 65 or older. Uh, this age is associated with a number of changes in the microbiota, including an increase in the abundance of bacteroidetes. Uh, these numbers are maintained, but the composition uh, sort of evolves uh, um, continuously. Uh, so why do we need them? Uh, but so th by these bacteria have a very nice uh, uh, mutualism with the host. The host uh, provide the niche to these bacteria. Uh, they they uh, uh, also uh, give them the platform where they can grow. That's the intestinal mucus. Uh, that's also a source of nutrition uh, for, for these bacteria. And bacteria don't just sit idly, they reciprocate by, by um, benefiting the host through fermentation, biotransformation of drugs, uh, ure ureas activities, they synthesize certain vitamins, they metabolize drugs, but more importantly, they educate our immune system. And when we talk about the immune system, obviously the gut is the largest organ uh, when it comes to immune system. Uh, but uh, it's a two-way street. Uh, it's not just that the uh, uh, microbiota uh, is educating the immune system, but the immune system also sort of uh, maintains and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, tr uh, uh, trains uh, uh, and uh, can regulate the type of bacteria that we carry in our gut. And one of the best examples of this uh, uh, genetic response is, is basically uh, uh, shown in terms of HLA polymorphism, where uh, if you look at the upper GI versus lower GI, the type of antigens that are presented by these uh, HLA antigens 
uh, you know, uh, HLA receptors are are very different, and that actually then dictates the type of immune response that we carry in our, you know, the type of bacteria that we carry in our gut. So when you maintain that balance, you know, the immune balance with the gut microbiomes, uh, gut microbes, uh, when these parties communicate, you always have good relationship. Uh, and that is very critical to maintain that good health, where you maintain a level of regulatory T cells, which is very important in maintaining a, an immunity against, uh, against uh, infectious agents. Uh, but what happens when this alliance goes wrong? Uh, my, they, they, these that this balance or that this when this delicate balance is, is perturbed, you have uh, you know a significant amount of diseases actually. I mean, uh, so there is a multiple hit hypothesis for how the microbiota of uh, industrialized societies has lost diversity over time, uh, and this was likely altered at multiple stages of human evolution as diversity and quantity of dietary microbiome uh, associated, uh, microbiota associated carbohydrates decreased um, uh, with, with uh, you know, from compared to hunter gatherer to agriculture, uh, industrialized food production and processed food. The model reflects uh, data that indicate a corresponding decrease in microbial diversity. Uh, so, and then you, what you see here uh, uh, is while diet is likely a key mediator of microbiota diversity, additional technological and medical leaps uh, while providing solutions for important problems such as infectious disease uh, have likely served as insults to the microbiota. These multiple hits have prevented the maintenance of microbiota diversity over several generations. So, we all know that uh, diet influences microbiome composition. Uh, question is how? Uh, so the long-term diet is associated with development of specific enterotypes. Factors that drive changes in microbiota are still being worked out. Um, and I talked about microbiota accessible carbohydrate or max, which are found in dietary fiber, play a key role in shaping this microbial ecosystem and are strikingly reduced in the Western diet relative to uh, uh, traditional uh, diet. So here is an example. You have various types of bacteria. You have unaffected bacteria shown in green. You have mucus degrading bacteria shown in pink. And then we have fiber degrading bacteria uh, shown in blue. And then uh, in, uh, uh, in red is, is a pathogen. So when mice were given a set of uh, uh, synthetic bacteria shown here as gut commensals, uh, they were colonized with a synthetic mi this uh, microbiota and fed a fiber-rich diet. When that uh, these these diets have more fiber-degrading bacteria uh, and a very thick uh, mucus layer uh, lining and are uh, basically pr uh, protected from disease. Okay. In contrast, when mice were fed fiber-free diet, um, they have an outgrowth of mucus-degrading bacteria. Uh, you know, which are shown in pink. You can see our abundance of these. They cause the thinning of this mucus layer, uh, and these uh, these animals were more uh, uh, susceptible to uh, infection by an enteric pathogen. So, speaking of enteric pathogen, my lab has been working for about 15 years now uh, on a gram-negative bacterium called Citrobacter rodentium, or CR. I will be calling uh, this uh, from now onwards. It belongs to a family of bacterial pathogens that cause attaching and effacing lesions in, uh, in, 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 the, in mice. And they are very similar to what happens uh, in humans when they are infected with ent entropathogenic E. coli or enterohemorrhagic E. coli. These e uh, infections cause significant health issues, including diarrhea, uh, vomiting, and in some cases, colitis, actually, okay? So mice that are infected with this CR, uh, they develop crypt hyperplasia, which is in, uh, in, uh, enhancement of the glandular structure in the colon. And the inflammation is dependent upon the type of uh, genetic background that we use for mice. So we first wanted to actually uh, see whether the mice are infected. So we took the uh, uninfected uh, mice colon from the uninfected mice, and then we infected mice with CR for about 12 days, and then we perform a transmission electron microscopy. So you can see that compared to uh, no bacteria here in the uninfected, you can see bacteria all over the place shown here as these uh, kind of bacilli. They're not only present on the surface, but you can see that they are deep inside, inside the mucosa. And what actually this presence does 
it causes a significant change in uh, the length of these glandular structure called crypt in the colon uh, in the infected mice. And it also leads to significant um, uh, recruitment of immune cells, uh, as you can see. So we wanted to see if, we, uh, can we uh, then use uh, some dietary approaches to prevent this inflammatory uh, 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 you know, immune response. So we took two different uh, diets. The first one was a 6% pectin diet. Now pectin is a, a soluble fiber, it's a prebiotic. So you heard from Dr. Nirja about probiotics. So I will, I will try to give you some insight uh, on prebiotics, which are uh, 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 nutrition of uh, food uh, nutrients that actually help uh, and support the growth of uh, good bacteria or probiotics. Uh, so uh, pectin is a soluble fiber. It requires microbes for butyrate generation. Uh, we wanted to do a proof of concept experiments where we also use a 6% tributyrin diet, which is a butyrate prodrug. However, it does not require uh, 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 fermentation by the gut bacteria. On the contrary, it requires host lipases to generate the uh, three molecules of butyrate. So we did a 16S uh, ribosomal uh, sequencing, sorry. and you can see that, sorry. Okay, um, so you can see that uh, uh, these are uh, the uh, uh, sequences from a um, group of normal mice. Um, you can see that the bad bacteria shown here in uh, red, which is the protobacteria, is very, very small, uh, you know, uh, in, in prison. Most of them are dominated by bacteroidetes and formicutes. However, when we infect them with the citrobacter, uh, you can see that proteobacteria almost are the dominating uh, 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 class, uh, sorry, uh, phyla. Uh, and then when we treat them with uh, a pectin, uh, it um, more or less uh, sort of uh, uh, starts to resemble the uninfected uh, uh, colon. So we saw significant uh, uh, restoration of uh, commensalism, if you will, uh, in response to uh, uh, pectin. Uh, and the same response was shown with tributyrin diet. Uh, so we did a, a pan bacterial uh, staining for uh, uh, lumen of the gut. So this is called EUV338 that labels all the bacteria in the lumen of the gut. Okay, so compared to uninfected uh, mice, this is the uh, staining for uh, uh, bacteria. You can see that when when uh, they are infected, uh, uh, they are um, uh, they these bacteria move in close to the epithelial monolayer. And when you put these mice on pectin diet, this pectin diet uh, uh, pushes them back to the lumen so that they are not necessarily in close contact with the epithelial monolayer. And that is very important, actually. I mean, because uh, this once this epithelial monolayer is, is, is uh, disturbed, these bacteria can move in, they can interact with the immune cells, and they cause systemic response. Uh, the same response was shown with, uh, with the tributyrin diet. Um, we have also shown previously that when we uh, uh, treat mice for a week with pectin diet, and then give them whole body radiation. This dietary pectin increases intestinal uh, stem cells. A lot of these crypts uh, are surviving. Uh, so these, there is a, 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 the number of mice that survive is much larger than those mice that did not receive pectin. And there is some increase in uh, uh, stem cells uh, that are very important in uh, crypt regeneration as a result of uh, you know uh, injury after a, after an injury. Uh, so. So how do we know that pectin is acting through a metabolite? Uh, so we know that when you eat fiber-rich diet, these bacteria act on these diet and they convert them into short chain fatty acids. So we measured uh, butyrate levels uh, as a, a sort of a prototypic example of uh, short, uh, uh, various metabolites. And you can see that uh, this is control uh, in, uh, at day nine. This is in response to infection. There is some increase, but it increases significantly when we do uh, pectin. So we took this uh, butyrate uh, uh, and uh, treated cells, uh, and we did a, uh, an RNA sequencing uh, experiment uh, where we compared, uh, um, we, what you're looking at here basically is a volcano plot, okay? Uh, and we compare uh, infection with control or infection with uh, a plus butyrate with control or infection with butyrate versus infection. So you can see that infection alone didn't have any effect. What you're looking here is uh, the the red dots uh, on the two sides of of the x axis, and you can see that some some of them are upregulated uh, uh, and some are down. The blue is non-specific, but compared to control, you have when you treat them with butyrate, uh, there is significant 
upregulation of these genes uh, in both of these situations. And we performed a heat map analysis and we get, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on a couple of genes that we have, we believe are very important uh, when, uh, so how butyrate is affecting expression of these genes. One of the most ex uh, important gene is MUC2. MUC2 is the part of the mucus layer, which I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, and so this MUC2 expression is very important and is regulated by butyrate. Uh, in contrast, uh, there, are, there are some uh, uh, pro-carcinogenic and, uh, and uh, inflammatory genes that are down-regulated, shown in green. So the red is up-regulation, the green is down-regulation. Uh, so some of the genes uh, uh, are down-regulated, for example, EZH2. Uh, RBM3, which is a proto-oncogene, as well as catenin, beta-catenin, which is also a proto-oncogene. Uh, so in summary, um, gut microbiome functions as a virtual organ and significantly extends metabolic capacity of the host. Uh, butyrate seems to have significant gene regulatory functions. And by targeting dysbiosis, uh, a new paradigm has emerged for developing new therapies for a, for a range of acute and chronic pathologies. Uh, so I think uh, both a combination of pre and probiotics can significantly increase our, uh, our chances of supporting our immunity so that we can fight uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus better. Uh, and hopefully we can extend this benefit to elderly population, which is which is where uh, most of this uh, uh, is needed, uh, in fact. So with that, I will uh, just acknowledge my people, uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, my uh, supports, uh, you know, uh, financial support, uh, and I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was a deep dive and uh, uh, also about, uh, we talked about prebiotics. So I am sure the audience is having a wonderful ride, uh, right from the defense mechanisms of the body to probiotics and now prebiotics and its implications. And now uh, the journey heads towards Himalayas. So our next speaker and the last speaker for today's session is Dr. Jyoti Prakash Tamang. I will... Um, uh, quickly introduce him to the audience. Well, he is presently the ICI MOD Mountain Chair for the year 2019 to 2021. He is the senior most professor in microbiology, serving in the Sikkim Central University in India. A pioneer food microbiologist who is working on ethnic fermented foods and beverages of the Himalayas for more than three and a half decades. Well, some of the areas that he focuses on include the sequence-based taxonomy, foodomics, gastronomy of the Himalayan ethnic foods, bioinformatics, food safety, nutrition, health benefits, etc. He has received several national and international awards. He's a fellow of several academics and a number of national and international forums related to the Food Science and Microbiology Committee. He has published about 165 research publications, including seven books from publishers like Taylor and Francis, USA, Nature Springer, etc. Well, today he holds a cumulative impact factor of 170 and the citation index of 4,529 and H index of 36 in the Scopus. He also has one patent to his credit. With this short introduction, uh, I would request Tamang sir to start with his presentation. Namaskar. Uh, I think I'll put. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Is it visible? You'll have to. It's okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay? Yeah, okay. Namaskar. <clears throat> the, my topic uh, is uh, immunity boosting formative foods of the Himalayas. So I will just go into the entire Himalayan regions, including the Hindu Kush Himalayas also. There are eight countries uh, located in the uh, HKS, what we call the Hindu Kush Himalayas. Uh, it includes the Myanmar also, Bangladesh also, Bhutan, India, Nepal, China, uh, uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So if you see the gastronomy, the, that is the, more, the cushions and the culinary 
uh, uh, cultures or the distribution of the food habits in the HKS, the rice is stable in the eastern part, followed by the maize and the finger millets, barley, and the soybean, both fermented and non-fermented, and of course the milk products and alcoholic drink. But if you go to the west, right from uh, the Ladakh, or the Kashmir in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, it is not a rice, it is a wheat, it is a stable food, and <clears throat> uh, several milk and milk products. There are more than 5,000 varieties of the fermented food in the world, consumed as a stable curry, side dish, uh, fried fish, and so on. In the Himalayan Hindu Kush, there are more than 100, 1,000 region-specific ethnic fermented foods and alcoholic beverages, and more than 3,000 ethnic non-fermented foods. So this is the <clears throat> picture of the traditional, uh, typical Himalayan thali. And uh, cultivation of soybean is very important, mostly in the eastern part of the Himalayas. There are two types of the uh, soybeans. One is a yellow variety, and then another is a brown varieties. And <clears throat> these are also consumed as a non-fermented, as a roasted. Uh, and most of them are uh, being fermented into the very delicate delicious uh, products and they have uh, different vernacular names like kinema is uh, known in nepal sikkim and darjeeling and bhutan hawaii are in uh, manipur and turangbai then bekam perian and akhuni and in china in the most in the southern part of china the similar type of uh, the food is called the dauchi and in uh, in myanmar is called the pibok and Kinema is called in Bhutan. And these are all the uh, bacillus, most of the bacterial fermenta uh, fermentations. And there are soya beans which are being fermented by the molds also. There's a soya sauce in China and daoji in China. Then supu is a fermented uh, product of tofu. What, uh, <clears throat> there are many health promoting benefits of uh, the fermented soya bean product like for example, the kinema is very cheapest source of the plant protein food compared to the milk and the animal. And it contains all amino acids and it is very rich in the linoleic acid. The total amino acid free amino acids are increased. Phytoesterols, that is a cholesterol lowering effect is uh, present in kinema. And it has a vitamin, riboflavin and the niacins. Then uh, kinema has a uh, uh, antioxidant uh, activities and also some uh, uh, some bioactive compounds which are very important that uh, for the uh, as a health promoters that is the saffron isoflavin and all now this is the picture which uh, since uh, professor prajapati has told me to uh, give only for the 10 minutes or a few slides so i've just concentrated on the the product the food which uh, which are uh, being projected uh, to increase the immunity. So I have uh, uh, I have selected the, here the kinema, the fermented soybean food. And we collected the kinema sample from uh, the different countries, the India, Nepal, and Bhutan. And we did uh, the hydroport sequencing. And what we have found is that we used to use the bioinformatics. Then this is the new type of what we have used, the Burinto <clears throat> software. And this slide shows that some bacteria which we have detected have a very, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, ha are showing the predictive uh, metabolic pathways, mostly uh, concerning the, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> uh, the health promoting benefits, most of the amino acid and all. So this is a very good, uh, uh, the model which we have uh, found and we have just, uh, uh, we have designed this and we have uh, communicated to uh, scientific reports and all. We are applying the same type of the model in the other food also. So in probably in coming uh, months, uh, coming years and all, we may have a several type of the uh, papers uh, related to this because this gives a very good picture of the entire functionality, the metabolic, what we call the functional profiles, even the disease profiles, even some of them have a disease or not. Uh, the some of the metabolic pathways, especially the metabolism related to the amino acid, fatty acid, and so on, and the vitamins, cofactors, and all. So this is a very, uh, very uh, important <clears throat> uh, the model which we have designed to predict the functionality, and we can choose and we can select 
they uh, they start their cultures uh, to improve to make a functional food uh, even applying uh, with the other substrate also now similarly we have <coughs> isolated uh, the lacto uh, lactobacillus plantarum I mean, we did the uh, whole genome sequencing uh, one is from dahi from the himalayan areas uh, then another is a fermented soybean which i uh, uh, i have just shown and what we have found is that very important thing is that the the rate is indicated the immunity protein so this is a very uh, the uh, you know the uh, there is a very novel findings what we claim we already published his published in the frontiers in microbiology and all and we are still looking for the other the bacteria and <clears throat> even the yeast and the molds also to which have a functional uh, abilities and we do the whole genome sequence we are doing and we found that what are the different type of the biotic compounds like uh, the uh, especially related to the uh, immunity booster so beside that we have a lot of uh, uh, several type of the uh, ethnic fermented milk products like churpi dahi lassi shrikhand in the entire himalayan areas and this is also one picture that we have done the <clears throat> the entire profiling of the micro biology by using the culture dependent the 16s rna gene sequencing and another this is a high throughput sequencing and all so this also gives a lot of uh, you know uh, the uh, the entire picture of the microbial community structures both the fungi uh, both the bacteria and the uh, fungi and what we have uh, uh, what we have selected some of them have the, uh, the, the uh, some of them can act as a probiotic candidates and all like in dahi and churpi uh, we <clears throat> did uh, gene detections and we found that uh, some of them have uh, the very strong uh, probiotic attributes uh, which uh, can be related to the protection against the diarrhea allergy related from serum cholesterols and all and what uh, dr nirza was telling is right that uh, we must uh, consume the uh, the the uh, the dairy products mostly the dahi the if we have a dahi every day and all we may not have the yogurt or you may not have a probiotic yogurt and all in the himalayas and all but i still dahi how the any milk pro, uh, fermented milk products and all i think probably they have some probiotics which are already in built systems and all and because we are we are consuming not only dahi but we are consuming the life bacteria and all and some of them some of them may may have the probiotics and that will help uh, in immunity boosters uh, in, uh, and the, in the boosting immunity also at the same time they are projected as a health uh, promoters and we have a different type of the fermented cereal products and nanis and jalebi and all and this is very interesting this is the uh, the entire uh, the ethnic breeds in kashmir in india pakistan Af Af afghanistan as i told you that the the stable diet is the wheat or the barley best so uh the 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 research has not been done on this also so we find that we have to we have to find out that what will be the gluten free the bread because these are all very important and all and now <clears throat> as you know the health promoting benefits of fermented foods the fermented foods have the several health promoting benefits and they produce the biotic compounds they <clears throat> like cancer prevention lowering blood cholesterol protect from the osteoporosis and so on so this is my last slide dhanyawad thank you very much sir yeah thank you very okay. much for the wonderful presentation sir yes uh, with this we have completed the uh, talk the four talks are done absolutely. now we uh, come to the the next part which is going to be a panel discussion panel discussion where the current hot burning topics will be discussed from uh, by the experts in this field uh, from all the panelists member uh, let me uh, quickly introduce dr prajapati sir who is going to moderate the panel discussion he, he did his dairy technology graduation from gujarat agricultural university and phd in dairy microbiology from ndri karnal since last 38 years he is serving as the faculty of dairy science in various capacities and from march 2015 he is the principal and dean 
of the Faculty of Dairy Science at Anand Agricultural University. He is handling a number of research projects sponsored by various government agencies and has published more than 400 papers. He he's a recipient of several awards, just to name one, which is Hari Om Ashram Award in 2015, which was awarded to him by ICAR for his outstanding research contribution in probiotics. He is on the editorial board of uh, several journals. He is the coordinator for the SASNET since inception 2003. He's a life member of several professional bodies, chairperson of the scientific panel on milk and milk products constituted by FSSAI. He's a member of the task force on inventory of microorganisms with documentary his, uh, documented history of use in food. And in a nutshell, if I have to describe him, he's one of the pioneers in academy who has exhaustively worked in probiotics. So with that short uh, introduction of his, I would request now Prajapati sir to take over for the panel discussion. Thank you, Kavita, and uh, thank you all the speakers for very nice uh, presentations. Actually, uh, we have accelerated a little bit time. Anyway, but still we have scope to have a few questions because I, I am monitoring the live chat on YouTube as well as the space session on Google Meet both ways. There are many questions coming, but uh, we'll sort out only few. Uh, uh, I have first question for Professor Nair. Uh, actually, uh, many people have curiosity to know that the immune response comes when any invader comes to the body, whether it is a food or friend or foe, how do we differentiate that this response is good and this response is bad? And this has come from this ingredient or specifically coming from a specific probiotic strain or it is coming from something else. How we can differentiate this? Please unmute your mic, sir. You, you are on, you are muted. Dr. Kavita, please unmute for all speakers. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. I mean, no, I mean. Yes. Okay, yeah. No, that is a big question. Oh, yeah, that, that, that is a question. Mm, I, I don't know how to answer it, but I mean, you sh how to differentiate between between harmful and, and, and pro, pro and no, not pro. I mean, harmful. It is. It is by encounter only. I. I think. I mean, either you know by uh, reaction you get by a slight infection or something, or you have learned it from earlier. I mean, I, I, I say. I mentioned maybe you. You see that uh, adapted or learned behavior is one of the different mechanisms. So, for example, the social distancing uh, during these days is a, it's an adapted behavior, learned behavior. You you didn't get the infection, but you learned it. Uh, and and uh, and also you have so many things. So the, the question was how you differentiate. Hmm, I don't know. But of course, uh, uh, it, it, it is for a doctor to penetrate deeper. Uh, I mean, it is a clinical diagnosis and all those things, uh, whether it is. But usually, the 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 reaction you get. I mean, the the uh, I didn't mention the allergy, hyperimmunity, uh, um, uh, all those things. But uh, how you feel at the exposure is probably yes. the way, uh, and and then the diagnosis is on on the medical. Uh, I mean, expertise. Yes, so, sir. I understand. Do you think it is a acceptable answer for yes, all sir. of you? But uh, I will try to take uh, another update from Dr. Shahid on the same question. Dr. Shahid, uh, can you uh, supplement anything to this? Dr. Shahid, are you there? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so that uh, that's a great question. I mean, so one of the things that uh, our bodies do, uh, we have uh, these commensals in the gut. 
uh, that basically uh, provide what is known as the colonization resistance, right? So when 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 you have a group of bacteria uh, which are uh, uh, healthy in a, in a healthy person, uh, they basically limit the uh, interaction with any entry, any uh, any pathogen that that in, encounters. Uh, so uh, depending on the severity of uh, infection or inflammation. Uh, the the uh, the commensals uh, are, should be able to fight against uh, you know uh, any any possible invaders. Actually, I mean, what happens that when when this capacity of of our, our bacteria uh, in in our uh, healthy bodies, you know, I mean, when that capacity is compromised, uh, then what uh, happens is these these uh, uh, invaders take hold of your uh, system and they start attacking the immune system and some of these bacteria even for example h pylori lives in in us for 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 ages uh, before uh, before coming out you know i mean uh, to attack us number one number two uh, our our ability to fight infections is also compromised when uh, when we are given antibiotics uh, because then that wipes out all the good bacteria along with your bad bacteria actually and some of these even when you stop taking antibiotics it takes sometimes in you know, months or even years uh, to get back to the original uh, 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 you know uh, state and some of these bacteria may even never come back actually i mean so that leads to uh, a decreased capacity and number 3 uh, when when these um, uh, as we age we lose our uh, diversity uh, so our capacity to fight infections uh, decreases at the same time. So there are a lot of ways we can explain that. Yes, yes. I, I, I think uh, because there is there are so many students in the audience. I see on live chat there are more than 400 people who are watching, and there are plenty of questions coming from there also. But uh, I will have another direct question to Dr. Nirja. Uh, Actually, uh, Nirja already indicated in her presentation that uh, there is a difference between a probiotic and a fermented food. Uh, can you just uh, specify in a little bit more detail that how do you differentiate that whether you, you will get a benefit from consuming the uh, natural products like dahi or other? Dr. Tamang also specified it. So let us be a little bit more clear, uh, Dr. Nirja, on this. Please, your opinion on this, please. Your mic is on mute. Uh, so thank you, Professor Prajapati. Uh, traditional fermented foods are excellent for their nutritional benefit. Of course, we cannot deny that. We get a lot of nutrition. We get calcium, proteins, vitamins. Also, there are some health-promoting properties. Like, for instance, people who are intolerant to lactose cannot tolerate milk. They can consume the hay better because the lactose is digested by lactase enzyme in such products. However, probiotic products need to contain a scientifically tested probiotic bacteria, which has to reach the intestine alive in numbers of more than 10 to the power 8 CFU to give you a scientifically proven health benefit. So whether the health benefit is reducing risk of diarrhea or whether the health benefit is building your immune response by increasing, say, an NNK cell activity, that has to be uh, validated through scientific studies in humans. So the two categories are very, very different. And therefore, you have a curd and you have a probiotic curd. Because a probiotic curd would have that scientifically tested probiotic bacteria, which is gives you a health benefit. So uh, the question is not about having a traditional fermented food or a probiotic. Uh, or a probiotic. It is ha about having a traditional fermented food and a probiotic for a health benefit. Yes, that definitely. Bottom line is, bottom line is that uh, these health benefits are strain specific, strain and that's why we always need to mention that we strain. When there is undefined consortia, uh, we cannot say with confidence. No doubt, our experience is different thing, and clinically proven things are different thing. So yes. thank you, Dr. Nirja, for this, and uh, I will uh, put next question to uh, Dr. Shahid. Uh, being on the medical side, uh, are you uh, aware about any clinical trial taken of any probiotic food for this uh, SARS, uh, this coronavirus 2, COVID 2? Is there, are there any trials taken on this? Is there any information, Dr. Sai? 
uh, uh, not that I know of. Uh, I think, but but that's a great uh, point as well, because I believe that um, th 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 there are there are. I think a healthy gut can tackle COVID-19 better um, uh, because if you have, a, a, you know, when we talk about uh, 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 fighting COVID-19, the idea uh, to really, uh, uh, I use the word support the immunity, not so both, both, you know, we, sh we should basically be supporting our immunity and not necessarily boosting our immune system because both, both an overactive as well as an underactive immune response is bad, you know, for fighting COVID-19 actually. I mean, so the ability to really uh, 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 tackle um, COVID-19 is through a, 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 a better immune response. Now, with that being said, uh, there are a lot of trials uh, at, even at medical center, you know, which are uh, going on in response to uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there is another response, uh, in, uh, another trial going on with uh, remdesivir, which is antiviral. I am not aware of any probiotic or prebiotic uh, a trial, uh, which which should technically be a, a you know a feasible and long term approach to to fighting this uh, this virus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shai. Uh, I will, I will, I will try to ask the same question to Dr. Nirja because she is compiling a lot of information about the. Uh, robotic science, so she may be aware about some of the things which are done in any of the countries in the world. Dr. Nirja, please, your comments. Again, her mic is off. Please keep it on. So not specifically, Professor Prajatapati, not specifically a trial, but there are a lot of studies recently which have shown gastrointestinal disturbances in COVID-19 patients. So there are uh, symptoms of diarrhea, uh, nausea, you know, in patients who have COVID-19. And therefore, the National Health Commission in China have actually used probiotics in treatment of these patients because they help to improve the balance of the intestinal flora and to prevent uh, secondary infections. So gastrointestinal uh, disturbances and septicemia is something that has been observed in some of the COVID-19 patients. And like Dr. Shahid said, that because 70% of our immune system is actually in the gut, uh, supporting a healthy immune system, supporting a healthy gut with more numbers of beneficial bacteria and lesser numbers of the harmful pathogens would be, uh, you know, one of the ways to also probably fight this disease. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nirja. Uh, uh, from this side, let us move to a little bit on traditional foods. Dr. Tamang gave a very nice presentation. And uh, I'm happy to note that uh, northeastern region of the country has very rich biodiversity of flora and fauna. And uh, with this, uh, you indicated so many foods. But in your opinion, uh, which food uh, can be commercialized to enter into the world market? Do you have any suggestion that out of so many foods, soya based or other foods, which foods are possible to be uh, scaled up to a commercial scale? OK. <clears throat> Uh, it's not a suggestion. We have already initiated uh, with the three organizations so where I'm involved. One is there is a DBT Institute, National Institute, Institute of uh, Bios and Sustainable Development. Uh, <clears throat> with, the, with the suggestions from uh, the director, Professor Polok Mukherjee, uh, we are now working, I'm uh, advising uh, them uh, to select uh, at least one foot from each, uh, each state and all. Then uh, uh, in the first phase, we have already identified the soybean best and the cereal best food and all, which are common <coughs> in Sikkim, Manipur, and Mizoram. And now the scientists are working on that. What we are trying to do is that uh, we have done a lot of work on that also, compiling and all, coming to the, uh, the, uh, the development of the functional food and all. You know, What is very important thing is that the food of the Northeast or the Himalayans are already popular among them because these are the cultural products. You know, whatever you do, the people like to have a traditional dahi instead of having the commercial dahi and all. If the if they get in the village and all, but in the town we have in the cities we don't have the the traditional. We have to buy the commercial dahi and all. So people are aware of their tradition. But what is the very important thing is that out of that 
if you want to diversify that food to the other non-consumers of the other parts of the thing. So we are already doing that. This is one. Then another is uh, then uh, the IBSTs. We are thinking to come to the development and link with the state uh, government to at least uh, to do some cottage industries and all. This is one uh, pilot project. We are working on that. Uh, hopefully, uh, within a year, we will come uh, with some result. And another is the TIFAC of the DST has already identified the uh, the traditional resources, not only food and all food I am looking after. So they are trying to do that, uh, identify some of the food, and this will be given to the Nidhi Ayok. So once the Nidhi Ayok will make a policy and all, I think the government will uh, notify that some of this food can be commercialized. And the third is the IFSSI, FSSI, where I am a member in the alcoholic group. So there the group uh, have, uh, we have already endorsed and we have already recommended that the, that the committee has already been constituted under my uh, leadership in the group. So what we are trying to do, not only North, is the entire the alcoholic beverages. So always in the FSSI, we are always going for the whiskey, brandy, champagne of the others. But we are not giving any emphasis on our own local daru. I mean, I mean, please do, do not take in the thing because we have to take the alcohol is also needed for us, you know. Yes. So at least to promote our traditional alcohol, the committee has FSSI has officially accepted and we are making, we are about to finish the report and will submit the report. Probably that report will go to the higher authority and all. So these are the development. Yes, yes. thank you, Dr. Tamang for very nice input. Actually, uh, we are also working on uh, a DBT project with Meghalaya and we have also developed a very good rice very good. beer yes. uh, and that can be taken on a national level and right. probably I will ask Dr. Subrata to join with you in this uh, popularization of the products. Right, right. Uh, if uh, time permits, I will take one round of question again. Kavita, you don't mind, no? Uh, because there no are problem, sir. Plenty of questions coming in. I am I am monitoring on my mobile the questions coming from YouTube, and uh, yes, sir. To put and even uh, Dr. Nair is very one interesting question uh, that if you be healthy, you be if you be happy, and if you do not have any tension, whether your immunity will improve. Mike, please, please unmute. I'm Dr. Nair. Yeah. Okay. The question is, if you are, if you are healthy and happy, ha being happy, feeling happy will increase our immunity or not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, there, there, there is some. I mean, the the uh, make believe, make believe. Uh, uh, there is a there is a make believe. If you think. Then it will work like that. There, there, there is a uh, small link, but I, I, I do not know. I cannot say with, uh, with uh, authority uh, any answer to it. But uh, there, there are uh, you, you can, you can, I mean, how you feel and how you are. They are, I mean, uh, it is. In fact, they are related, and it is a, uh, it, it, it is a circle. I mean, it. It goes on. So my, my, my answer is yes. Uh, uh, the content. I hope. I, I hope it is. Yes, I also agree with you because what you believe and what you feel is different. But Dr. Shahid want to speak something. Is are there any clinical evidences for such things, Dr. Shahid? Yeah, hey, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there. When you are happy, you know. I mean, uh, you make others happy as well. You know. I mean, so. Um, uh, it's not. I think happiness uh, is is a very relative factor. Uh, but what actually helps in terms of uh, maintaining a healthy uh, a, a immune uh, system is when you get enough sleep, you eat appropriately, you know, and you follow a certain routine, uh, you know. Uh, and so when you balance your diet, uh, you don't go to McDonald's on a daily basis, you know. Um, and we have had we have had these issues uh, so much. Uh, US is on top of US is on top of the list for a number of obese people, unfortunately. And so that all of that does reflect upon our bodies. Uh, that's why they, they 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 keep fighting until they reach a, a, a 
place where they can't fight it anymore. Uh, and then you uh, basically uh, support, start taking supplements. And, you know, supplements are fine. You know, I mean, you what you have to really do is uh, think about what are the best ways to increase our microbiome diversity. And you do that by eating a wide range of, you know, uh, I, I'm a big fiber supporter, so I would say high fiber uh, plant-based foods. Uh, Dr. Tamang uh, said beautifully, you know, I mean, laid out uh, all the program. So I think it has to be a combination of a natural yogurt, uh, you know, uh, uh, kefir, kombucha, Korean kimchi, Mediterranean diet. Um, I think healthy shopping is probably better than stockpiling toilet papers. <laughs> <laughs> sir, with due respect, may I just quickly add one point, sir? Yes. yes. Uh, the, the question is how to accommodate among alcohol. Uh, okay. <laughs> sir, uh, actually, it is said that uh, the gut bacteria, the probiotics, they are responsible for 90% of the dopamine, the GABA, and um, there's one more neurotransmitter which gives us a feeling of, uh, you know, relaxation or being happy. So these Seren hormones, the root... Serotonin, yeah, that's the missing one. Yeah. So all the three neurotransmitters, they are produced as a metabolite by the good bacteria in our gut. So... That's a, that's, a, that's a very good point, uh, Dr. Yeah. Kavita, because 90 percent, 90% of our uh, serotonin is made by the gut bacteria. I mean, people don't know that, you know, a lot of times, actually. I mean, and that is enough to keep you happy, basically, you know. Yeah, uh, I think... Uh, uh, just one, uh, just one suggestion, Sunday. I mean, uh, conversation, Sunday. See, among us now, the senior most is uh, Professor Babu Nair. So we must learn from him. Of the, we must. He should uh, tell us the secret how he is maintaining his immunity, how he is healthy, and all. So I think. I think. I think and okay. another is what I am trying to do. That also, our youngsters. Should be there should be the case studies those who are above nineties like in Japanese and many I mean, Indians also even our own grandfather grandmothers we must learn from them not only food their habit their everything you know the culture their ethics their uh, the the thing I think these are all important to uh, make uh, ourselves uh, the healthy happy and peaceful and joyful. <laughs> Yeah. Can, 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 before Dr. Nair answers it, can I answer? Can I can I answer something? Yes, yes, yes. Please, please continue, Dr. Shai. I think I think I think we should take uh, Dr. Nair's poop and give it to every young person. You know, I mean, who is having problem with immunity? You know. <laughs> should, I should I tell his foot? <laughs> <laughs> can I? Yeah. As people like I had one sound that you will do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I know that Dr. Nair is taking regular food as we all are taking, but there are many other factors which plays role in yeah. immunity. Dr. Yeah. Nair, please. You, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, now, now, uh, I I must tell you that if you if you were I I have I have in fact uh, uh, during the month of May, I have uh, developed the ultimate breakfast uh, and and uh, and i would like to send you my powerpoint uh, presentation on the ultimate breakfast for all of you you can test you can test and and then give me your resp uh, i mean <laughs> response <laughs> wow. okay for you yeah. I, uh, I will i will collect, I will collect your uh, email from Kavita, and I will send you, you this my ultimate breakfast and try that. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yes, sir, we'll definitely try that. But, 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 but Professor Nair, yes. Professor Babu, we need your not yes. breakfast. We are suffer also in the evening. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the wine which we are drinking, that's very important. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 yeah, you have to. You have, of course, I mean, uh, the, the monotonous, I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to diversify. But uh, uh, I was not thinking to, to put this forward, but uh, I have uh, sent this uh, to some of my friends. But now the question came. So I would like to share with you my ultimate breakfast. 
<laughs> good one get, yeah. get your get your uh, uh, reply to it i challenge me i i challenge you to to prove me wrong right, right. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Okay. We'll, we'll take up. We'll take up that. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. one more question, uh, which, which, many people ask me. I wanna. I'm asking today to Nirja, <laughs> and people are asking on the YouTube also that why a healthy person should take a probiotic. Is it necessary for a healthy person to take probiotic? Please, please throw some light on this. <laughs> yes. 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 So, what happens is uh, one of the most neglected organs is the gut. And now we know that we have those 100 trillion microbes in the gut. And it's we've heard it in this entire webinar that it's very important to have more common cells, more beneficial bacteria as compared to the harmful ones. Now, because of lifestyle, the kind of life we lead because of stress, because of poor nutrition, because of irregular sleeping habits, because of lack of physical activity, there is a decline in the beneficial bacteria. So probiotics are just one such intervention which reach your intestine alive, improve the balance of the intestinal flora, increase the beneficial microbes, decrease the harmful microbes, and build your immune responses. So one is we are not actually testing our gut microbiota on a day-to-day -day basis, but the imbalance in the gut microflora results in more than 25 disorders. We've just heard constipation, diarrhea. Now we know metabolic disorders are also linked to an imbalance in the gut flora. So probiotics or prebiotics or symbiotics for that matter are interventions which help to increase the beneficial bacteria and maintain a healthy balance of the gut flora. Yes, yes, that is good. And I agree with you. Uh, actually, there are many questions on the symbiotic food and people are asking the examples. See, the greatest example of symbiotic, which I feel is Panjamrut, which is well known since centuries, where it has a dahi and having good lactic acid bacteria and a honey as a source of prebiotic. And there are, uh, say, Amur Slavia is also a symbiotic product, and there are many examples available in the market. But I have a specific question to Dr. Tamang that uh, yeah. Northeast has a very rich biodiversity of plantations. So instead of using a uh, prebiotic as a component, purified component, extracted component, if you use the natural resource like chicory, onion, banana, other things, and make a symbiotic food, it may be better and more cost effective. Uh, what is your opinion about the natural, yes. uh, which are rich in, rich in prebiotic components in your no, region? No, no, you're right, because the bioresources to uh, use as a prebiotic is very important. So in that, what you have mentioned, all the plants and all the fruits, I add the soya beans, and the gluten-free, the finger millets, you know, these are all also very important and all. The traditional crops are all important for the prebiotics and all. Those who are endangered and which have been now in the very neglected areas, especially in the Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, Kashmir, Ladakh, and in Northeast regions and all, there are crops, the minor crops, which nice. are that what uh, Dr. Sahit has said that these are all fiber, fiber rich, gluten-free, and so many, you know, the unexplored my thing, and this can be used as a prebiotics. Yes, yes. Uh, very nice, Dr. Tamang. Actually, uh, many more questions are pouring in, but we will try to go to our uh, conclusion. Actually, as far as these minor millets are concerned, uh, the millets were earlier, they were poor <coughs> cheap food because they were grown very much and they are very cheap. But now it has become costlier, the, costlier than the, the basic uh, uh, cereals and so it, they are costlier than the rice and wheat because now people have become conscious about the richness okay. of minerals in that the, the, the type of fiber which they have and so and uh, we at our dairy science college at smc college of dairy science also developed many foods uh, containing such cereals and fruits and policies and also enriched uh, with uh, good indigenous property cultures and adding the uh, natural resources of uh, components which will provide them a prebiotic component and ultimately to do a symbiotic product. So uh, with this, uh, uh, we'd like to conclude the session because we have gone ahead of about 25 minutes ahead of the time. And I thank all the speakers for very live and interactive session. Very good, nice answers. Probably there are uh, so many uh, uh, questions in the live chat we could not answer, but I request the organizers and Dr. Kavita to look to that. And then yes, we'll try to 
reply them probably individually all we have a supplement uh, youtube platform, uh, where the questions will be specifically addressed uh sure, so uh, once again i thank all of you uh, and especially khalsa college for managing the it uh, activities logistic from there and uh, all the members of sustained fermented foods and all the uh, four london speakers to be with us and manage the show thank you very much thank you all thank you thank you thank you yes sir uh, dr yes, sir. Sire, uh, we couldn't see your picture i just want to see oh oh my god i have my camera on but uh, for it's some reason camp, but... <laughs> but I uh, couldn't I'm, see you. I think you have my, seen my, me, but I just want to see you. Oh Sometimes my! When you meet, I can recognize you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very handsome. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, I mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> can you oh. just switch on the camera? My uh, the camera is. I, I have the camera on, so I don't know for some reason. Oh, size is there, but uh, yeah. your camera, uh, your picture is not coming. For some reason, I I don't yeah. know how to fix it. Okay. Anyway, we can send the photograph. We can. I must congratulate uh, Professor yes, Prithapati and the entire team for organizing this very meaningful uh, webinar. And uh, thank you very I much. Thank you, thank, you, thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is a very wonderful webinar yes. without any drink, without any food. <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll we have a very <laughs> so, so anyway, we hope to have many more such webinars in the future, uh, Professor Prajapati, Dr. Kavita, and uh, definitely, we'll... ma'am. Yeah, we'll work on that. Yes. yes. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank Dr. you all. Yeah. Dr. Subrata and Dr. Kavita for organizing this. And Thank you, sir. Uh, at last, the Sai Sab said that ki, uh, good morning. Abhi to yahan to raat ho gaya. Good evening. Good night. <laughs> good night, sir. Uh, uh, I think it is a. It is a okay. I think the midday in uh, in Sudan. Yeah. yeah. I think it is yes. midday. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Now it Thank is our you. Dinner time. Thank you very much. Dhane okay. baat. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.